Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the AI for All podcast. Uh, I'm Ryan Chacon. My co-host today, Neil Zahoda, is out, but we have a very exciting episode for you today. We're going to be talking about AI solutions and how they are unlocking efficiency and productivity within organizations, for individuals, all that kind of good stuff. And to discuss this, we have Nicola Merkschus, the CEO and co-founder of Poly AI. They are a provider of AI-powered voice assistance. Nicola, thanks for uh, being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Let's uh, kick this off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself, your background experience, and then introduce the the company that um, you're a part of. My name is Nikola Merkšić. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Poly AI. Poly AI is um, a leading provider of voice assistance for customer service. Um, we help companies become the best version of themselves in every call they take by uh, providing voice automation that is incredibly lifelike, human-like. Um, often you're not really aware that you're speaking to a non-human, right? The goal is not the trick, but it's really to help you forget that it's technology. It should be natural enough for you to not actually have to think about whether it's a human or not. You should just interact with um, a voice assistant in the same way that you would with a human, right? If you can do that, it means it works. And, um, you know, we work with um, companies like FedEx, PG&E, Marriott, Caesars, uh, you know, companies that really care about their brand and that um, are able to, you know, be much better operationally efficient, but also just to meet their customers in the preferred channel, right? So if it's over the phone, over the phone, not by pushing them onto like the website and uh, on panels that are cheaper to serve, but really kind of like meeting them with a really powerful and high quality experience over the phone as well. And where are you seeing voice assistants powered by AI really take off? Like where's adoption increased the most? Where do you see the biggest demand right now? We see them everywhere, right? Uh, in terms of, um, you know, industries we serve, we're in hospitality, we're in financial services, we're in telco, we're in retail, we're in logistics, travel, everywhere, really. Because I think what's happened since generative AI really took up is that we have a renewed confidence in uh, AI's ability to deliver the next generation experiences. And I think that's really, really good for, um, you know, not just experimenting, but really deploying things at scale. Um, I think that previously, um, you know, our customers were companies that wanted to be pioneers, that wanted to really do something that's ahead of the game. Uh, right now, when people volunteer an AI initiative, it's something that's really welcomed by the board. Often they get uh, others in their company fighting over sponsoring and overseeing the project rather than, um, you know, kind of like the typical like, ah, does it really work? Getting the pushback and yeah, trying to, yeah, making it harder to start to, to launch or deploy within an organization for sure. So let me ask you, um, generally speaking, when we talk about different AI solutions, one of the biggest things is about what does it unlock for an organization, for individuals within an organization, efficiency, productivity, things like that. What are you seeing as the biggest kind of um, advancements with AI solutions coming into companies where you know they're not going to get that pushback because they're able to do X, Y, and Z within an organization for the workforce. What are, what are you seeing kind of lead the way there? In the case of customer service, what's really happened since COVID is like a massive inability to hire and keep people in those jobs. So, so the attrition rate is huge. And what's that done is create, it's created a crisis in customer service where companies are struggling to provide the same level of service that they did pre-pandemic. And the problem has become endemic and very, very persistent, right? So what people are able to do with AI there is just put a lot of, um, you know, really good service in front of their customers and get those service levels back to a level which is acceptable. Great, right? Where even if you might have only two thirds of the agents you did before, and this is not because someone goes in and says, I'd like to be more efficient, so I'm going to let people go. People have been leaving on their own, right? It's not rare for us to see contact centers with 200% churn, right? And that's just like annual, right? And that, when you think about that, that's frightening, right? Because people are, if the average tenure of an agent is six months, then you know that they don't really have the time to learn the products they're supporting, to learn the right answers to questions, to experience different situations, 
um, you know, escalate to their manager enough times to learn where the right information is. Um, so it's really hard to like get them on board, right? Um, and to get like a high level of service. So, you know, we're helping people now pick up every call immediately. We are uh-huh. able to deal with a huge portion of these calls automatically, as well as a human way. And when we can't, it's no longer like acrobatics to get out of it. You say like, hey, I want to speak to a human. Done, right? Um, if you do it that way, then you're building that trust between the system. And, you know, what the contact center uh, leaders see in the end is like a massive improvement in, you know, time to pick up, first call resolution, in um, abandonment rates. That's like a really important metric in the contact center, like how many people are giving up before reaching an agent. And obviously, if you are able to pick up immediately, it's zero because you pick up every time, right? Um, and, um, you know, if even if you're dealing with half of the things automatically, that means that your remaining staff are able to do the other half of the calls really well in time. They're able to uh, do what's called the wrap, wrap up time, kind of like after the call where they log what they've done and how they've done, they can do it slowly without rushing to pick up another call. So the whole, just like, you know, the blood pressure of the whole thing just drops and like people can breathe again, focus on their jobs that adds to agent happiness, that improves retention and creates a very virtuous cycle. And, you know, the other thing that they get out of, um, you know, strong voice assistance is a wealth of data about what's actually happening in the business at scale, right? Because these things are deterministic, they can... They behave in ways that are predictable and easily modifiable by the business. Typically, you know, if you wanted to change a procedure in the contact center, you need to put all agents through training. You need to check that they, you know, change something they might have been doing in one way for years, and now they have to do it in a different way. Um, what you can do now is you can run an A-B test and see, like, hey, what if I, like, do this in that situation? How does that change my containment rate? How does it change my FPS score? And then more importantly, you just get a lot of data around the specific issues that are happening in your organization, and then you can feed it back to the business. And that makes the contact center a whole lot more valuable to the business because it starts becoming a much more valuable dashboard, right? Where then the whole company can reprioritize different issues, be it operational or product related to say, hey, a lot of people are calling and asking about that thing. I guess it wasn't clear. Maybe we should put the instructions there. Or maybe, you know, something about the design of a product needs to change to make it bit simpler and easier to use. So um, it's a brave new world. And I think that the role of the CX leader is changing because the moment right now for customer service and AI is very similar to, you know, what happened with the cloud, where a lot of companies that jumped on it first were able to become much more versatile and they've been able to, you know, be much better businesses and launch new initiatives more quickly, Uh, not to mention like operational efficiencies, but you know, those that pounce on this will have a pretty formidable advantage over the competition. One of the things that I've I've heard about also is the ability for these AI powered tools. Talk about virtual assistants. We talk about kind of natural language processing that's happening as well, right? To really help personalize or add a level of personalization at scale for these organizations that may not have been available beforehand. A lot of this is really focused on enhancing customer interaction. You've already mentioned streamlining operations and that kind of customer journey, right? Talk to me about what these tools are enabling organizations to do on the personalization front. I think that's kind of an area where it really could change the experience people have interacting with um, customer service and these kind of, uh, you know, these journeys that they go on when, when dealing with a brand. So I think, you know, like if you were an agent in isolation, and, you know, I know Ryan's calling and I know, you know, like I might know some stuff about you if I can like identify based on the phone number. If I were able to read and prepare for the call with you, right, and know a bit more about you, then, you know, I'm like, say, you know, I might be able to upsell you on something. I might be able to get to the bottom of the issue. If I see you've in the past called about something that you needed help with, like maybe I can just jump straight to it and say like, hey, hi, Ryan, good to see you again. Is this about your flight to uh, London? Um and then you might say, no, 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 it's actually like I want to book you on. Cool, fine, right? But like, if it is, I think you'd be like very positively delighted around like, yes, it is. Like, I want to move it to that. Okay, no problem. That level 
of like customer, you know, focus, like that, that, that ability to do that level of customization is also tied to just how much investment there's been in the whole like, uh, digital stack of the company, right? The information has to be there in a way that can be consumed by the AI model. But the beautiful thing about like these models is that they can actually go through this and adapt their behavior, uh, really quickly and easily compared to a human, right? So it creates a chance to really facilitate some magical moments where you go like, wow. And even if it's like just recognizing your phone number and then like asking you one question instead of five, like that's a very effortless experience. Um, so I think like, you know, it's, it's what we should strive for. And I think, um, you know, you'll see more and more. An interesting part about all this AI, all these AI solutions is that it's unlocking new data insights that an organization can use. Talk to us about how organizations should be focused on understanding that, understanding what data is able to be unlocked when an AI solution is brought in and adopted by the organization, adopted by their employees, things like that. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to lead to that wider adoption, buy-in from upper management and really allow this to scale internally. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give you an example with, um, with contact centers, right? At the end of every call, the agent is, you know, supposed to put in a call reason. And um, I think that most people will tell you that these are notoriously inaccurate, right? How you phrase it, is it clear to people what it is? Can you have one or more call reasons? What do you think of when you say like cancellation or amendment of something versus like what someone else does, right? Um, can be very different. And agreeing that notation, like the inter-annotator agreement, if people just like did the same thing, it's not very high, right? It means basically that you don't have canonical representation that is clear to all. And because of that, a lot of mistakes happen because people don't have um, a lot of time, right? Or they're just not incentivized to do it well. And it's hard to check whether you're doing it well. So no matter how you turn it, you're not very incentivized to put in a lot of effort as a context center agent. Um, with voice assistance, um, what you're able to get out of it is just like a very precise and thorough understanding of why are people calling, what do you need to automate, what do you need to automate next? And then if you need, for example, to prioritize like a roadmap around like which system of record needs to be updated so that task A or B can be done in an automated way, you now know this one happens 17% of the time, this one happens 27% of the time, right? And you have very precise data. And this is something that used to be pretty difficult to ascertain because it's like, you know, you ask people, which one's more frequent? They're like, I don't know, I don't know, right? And like, they're not logging it correctly. And it's really, um, this is a big step up and it makes a big difference. As we move forward in this space, I think it's important for our audience to understand the key role of conversational AI, generative AI, LLMs, things like ChatGPT in that customer experience transformation. So what are the key things from everything that we've talked about so far that people listening to this should take away to say, here's how conversational AI, here's how generative AI is going to really take this CX industry forward and transform it for the better? There are many ways to do that. I think that there will be a lot of false starts and there's already quite a lot of scaremongering that is completely unwarranted. You know, you're, you've had people, uh, you know, build things where either the DPD chatbots started writing haiku about how um, they're the worst like delivery company in the world, right? And that was a prompt injection attack. It wasn't really in guard against. Um, you know, I think there was a, a Air Canada recently um, decided that they are going to follow through on like promises made by a chatbot that were just like bad programming, right? So um, a bunch of other examples, I think. Uh, there was a Chevy truck that uh, was given away for a dollar, something like that. It's, uh, um, I think like there will be a lot of full starts. What's interesting about generative is that it's never been easier to build a demo prototype. But I think companies have to be careful about like deploying this at scale and how they do it, right? Do they have the right like safeguards around it? Do they have an ability to test do all that? And I think, you know, we're kind of living through um, kind of like the early internet, right? Where like, you know, it took a bit of effort to put stuff together and create a good website. And I think, you know, companies like us, where we're, we're, we're able to build really good experiences for people. I think that the platforms themselves, when you think about like 
DIY and implementing it yourself. The temptation is there. This is fun stuff to play with. It's hard to get it right. And, you know, it's a cliche in the whole like, build versus buy and total cost of ownership. But uh, I think there's almost just a bit of uh, kind of like a feeling that this is making it a lot, whole lot easier to build. And the truth is that there is, it's a really, really sharp, right? So you can cut yourself very, very easily. And um, you have to be careful about how you do it. And I think for now, but build is difficult. We see companies increasingly thinking that they can do it and then kind of like wasting time. And we see those that are partnering with vendors who can kind of like give them a full on offering and a solution. We think they get to value a lot more. Alluding to some of the things you mentioned there, what are the risks when it comes to bringing and interacting with generative AI that organizations need to understand prior to going down this path at all? The risk is you have a black box, right? If you were just to use an LLM, to power this, you have a black box which you can give a lot of information to. And, um, you know, if you didn't specify, like, sure, you specify what to do, but you must also very carefully specify what not to do, right? And if you don't do that, then you'll get like hallucinations, right? And those hallucinations could be really, really dangerous, right? Because um, the system will be very confident. It will come out and just, you know, confidently assert things that you never mentioned because. It's been trained on so much data that, you know, I think an example, um, kind of like playing with it, you can try this out, like chat GPT, right? Just tell it, hey, you are now, I don't know, like the concierge of the Rosewood Hotel in London. And then you go, hey, tell me about the history of the hotel. It's probably going to know, right? But if you are, um, you know, concierge of Nicola's Inn and Suites, right? Um, it might just start like saying things that might seem sensible, right? Hey, where can I like, you know, get a razor, right? It's like, oh yeah, you can get it at like Walgreens down the road, down the road. Like it might just come up with things that are completely nonsensical, very, very confident, right? So I think kind of like um, building and designing around that so that you kind of like package it up and use LLMs effectively for things that are really good at, for example, contextual answers to questions and, you know, kind of like pulling from databases. Like the complexity shifts into how you do RAG, uh, retrieval and method generation, kind of like how you provide the context uh, that contains the right piece of information. Because if you don't, if you don't do that correctly, um, then you'll basically just have answers that are coming out of nowhere, right? And you won't know what happened or how it happened. It's hard to like audit it. It's hard to figure out exactly uh, why something's happening. So I think like. Um, you know, there's a lot to be impressed with, but there's also a lot that uh, could backfire if you apply these things in the wrong way. And how can um, organizations really safeguard these deployments, generative AI deployments, and, and just kind of be thinking about it from that perspective as they're going down this path? You know, one option is really kind of like working with companies that have built out the whole full offering around this so that, you know, they have a whole testing framework and, you know, like, Everything from unit tests to behavior tests, to like really extensive ability to see how changes they're making to the system impact, you know, like kind of agreed behavior of the thing and they're very good at testing it. Um, and I think that like if you're doing it on your own, it's very likely that you'll overlook something. Uh, but like the fact of the matter is like the science of testing assistance has never really been like solved. Right. So it's just really a matter of kind of like cybersecurity. You, know? you sign a red team and you're like, hey, break, it. do more to break. It. So do, do, do your worst. Right. And it takes really like an intimate understanding of how these things are trained to understand exactly how to trick them and do prompt injection. Right? So I think here we'll see like ingenious ways of like, you know, there will be systems that are pretty safe and then someone will crack one thing. I think there's also just, um, honesty with your consumers where they're like, listen, this is an LLM empowered experience. It could be wrong because right now Google might give you results that are not relevant, right? I think one of the best things Google did was, you know, showing the top 10 results because they're, you know, the probability that the right thing is in like the top three is a lot higher than it's like the number one result, right? So I think similarly with LLMs, I think we should just like get used to like, you know, having just a bit of skepticism around the result we get. Because effectively, it's a search engine over, you know, a parameter space, which has consumed a lot of data, but it doesn't mean that 
that data is correct, right? Like a lot of it would be wrong. You know, much of what we know in general might be wrong, right? So like, um, you know, if someone gives you an answer to a question, you always take it with like a bit of skepticism. I think maybe there's like this thing with technology where we expect that it's perfect because like in theory, it could be better than us. And like, we're getting there, but like there should just always be a healthy dose of skepticism. And I think as society, if we accept that quickly, and you know, we get statistical about like what good performance is, then we'll reap the benefits, right? Because, you know, we, we all focus, for instance, on like, you know, the accidents that happen with autonomous driving. But the truth is, if we implement it fully, like we'd have less accidents on the road than we do right now, right? There's a quarter million people die on like Chinese roads every year, right? If it was fully yeah. automated, it would be fewer. And people, accidents would still happen. And uh, it's hard to reconcile all this, right? Thankfully for us, at least in customer service, we're not dealing with life and death situations. So I think it's, you know, it still matters. It's people's brand. We take it incredibly seriously. Um, but I think that, you know, we'll have to see how the societal expectations of this change. Um, you know, a lot of people say that AI needs to be like at the 80th percentile or even higher of human performance to be considered as good. So you know, we're just going to have to make it really good. And as we look out into the future, kind of throughout the rest of 2024 and beyond, what are your predictions for this space? Like, where do you see it going? Obviously, we I think we're both very bullish on the fact that adoption will likely increase, technology will continue to mature and get better. But where do you see this going? What are the what are the things people should be most excited and looking forward to? This is one of those things that goes like slowly, slowly, and then it happens really fast, right? So I think like we're seeing like you know early use cases and things built on top of LLMs that um, you know are beyond our wildest imagination, especially for like you know I don't know, creating images, video increasingly, and stuff like that. Um, I think like very, very soon we won't recognize the world around us in terms of like just everything will that will happen with technology, right? Our jobs will be fundamentally different, right? And I think, you know, as it usually happens, you'll see a younger generation adopted like much, much faster. And, you know, I think, you know, when you, when we look at a human being with a phone, you know, with a smartphone, if they went back to like, I don't know, ancient Rome, they would be demigods. They would know everything if they still had access to it. <laughs> which would be the um, time travel included. But um, I think like, you know, very soon, like people talk about the impact in education and just the ability to you know, like learn and what's even worth learning and how will, will we integrate with all that. Um, I think we, you, you know, and especially as we think about like, you know, consciousness melding and, you know, us becoming cyborgs and stuff. Um, I often think like, you know, we already are androids. Right? Like if you separate yourself from your smartphone, you feel like a lesser person. Right? So I think like um, when people fear AI and all of that, like I think we've fundamentally as a species, as a species, we have already changed, right? Profoundly. We are now like an interconnected hive mind, right? Where you can reach anyone if they're awake through WhatsApp. Like, so I think like we've already done a lot of the like digital transformation of our societies. And I think now with like these capabilities, like we're in for a whole another paradigm shift what it means to be human so i think it's going to be really really interesting um and you know if we do it well i think it will lead to huge improvements in quality of life if we if we can politically navigate it and make sure that like you know it's a reap by all but i think like you know most technology that improve lives of all humans and i think this one will be like the strongest for our audience who wants to learn more about kind of what you all have going on, um, maybe follow up on this conversation in any way, what's the best way they can reach out? Where can they learn more? Yeah, um, I think our website, poly.ai. You can also email me, Nicola, at poly.ai. Um, so, you know, we'd love to get in touch and if we can help people really, really become the best version of themselves in every customer interaction and put something on, the, on their phone lines, we'd love to help. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was great to have you. Uh, excited to get this out to our audience. I think the space that you're in is very interesting. We've um, been able to kind of follow it through conversations like this over the last number of months. And it's something that I think a lot of people, even if they're not in kind of um, the technology space, if they're not very familiar with AI, will start to interact with these types of solutions, um, even maybe without knowing it, which seems like the, the ultimate goal. So uh, thanks again for being here and um, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me.